Uh, I'd like to now um, present uh, Neil Gimmel from the University of Otago. And uh, this is a great title, Supernatural History, Male Harming Mutations, Fish Sex, Taonga Genomes and Monster Hunting. Um, brilliant title, I'm not sure how to be indexed, but, um, but I'm looking forward with great anticipation uh, to hearing what Neil has to say. Isn't it nice that we can meet like this uh, and not know each other and still have this level of informality? Um, I, I love that, actually, and that's one of the things that I love about Aotearoa in New Zealand. Uh, that's me, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get there. Um, so kia ora, um, I'm Neil. Uh, I grew up uh, about 30 kilometres that way, uh, in the Hutt Valley. Uh, so uh, um, this is special. It's special to come back to, to Wellington, and it's special to be honoured by uh, the Royal Society Te Aparangi. And it was very privileging and humbling to be part of uh, the Mihi Whakatū this morning. Um, and I think we've come a long way culturally in terms of the way we think about things and do things in New Zealand. And I'm proud to be part of that journey, although still um, uh, embracing uh, a large part of that and learning as I go. So yeah, it's an interesting title. And it's really uh, a grab bag of different things that I have worked on and over a course of my career. So growing up in the Hutt Valley, one of the things that I had to do quite a lot was explain why this kid who came from a relatively straightforward working class background was off at university, or university as we called it there, uh, and, and actually doing things that basically nobody in my far now understood. And so part of my journey has been in translating that work and making it relevant to the communities that I have been uh, a part of and am supported by. And that's been a very important part of my journey as I've gone through. And I'm trying to think about how this uh, genetics that I do may support our ambitions as a nation and also support uh, our aspirations to just make, to make this, keep this place special. Uh, so I've worked on lots of different things, including crows that are smart and tuatara and kaki, which is one of New Zealand's most endangered birds. And I've worked on abalone with Dave Shield, and I've worked on rats and how to eradicate them. And... Um, yeah, lots of different things. But I'm going to tell you about four things, which is possibly one thing too many, but um, as a university professor, that's sort of what we do, right? Um, so these are the four things, and I'll start without further ado and start telling you a little bit about a piece of work that I did uh, more than 20 years ago now, and it's an idea that we termed Mother's Curse. So I'm going to tell you about four things. One, of, and most of these are drawn together by some level of serendipity. They were conversations that started with other colleagues and then led to an interesting piece of work or an opportunity that arose um, through going to an international meeting. And in one rare occasion, a piece of work that started when I was a boy fishing on the wharf in Days Bay. Um, so this one is uh, basically the acknowledgement or the understanding or the identification that there are mutations that occur uh, that are bad for males and okay for women. And it arises because some parts of our genome are not inherited 50-50 from either parent. One part of our genome, the mitochondrial genome, which is a very small part of our genome, it's about 16,000 base pairs of information, that is inherited solely maternally uh, through the lines of most uh, living things. And it's actually quite an interesting paradox. But what that means is that if you get a mutation in that molecule that is... Um, bad for both sexes, then it'll get eliminated. If it's bad for women, it'll get eliminated. But if it's bad for males and not for females, that can just pass through and be retained. And so what we discovered, or hypothesised at that time, was that these mutations actually might be quite common, and that they could have some quite detrimental effects uh, to uh, humans in particular in terms of human health. Um, and and uh, also there was some evidence that suggested it might be involved in why males live generally shorter lives than women. But um, where this really started to get interesting for me was that I was working with a colleague called Frank Sin at the University of Canterbury, and he was interested in how these mitochondrial mutations might affect male fertility. And so we did a piece of work and we showed that there were indeed mutations that did seem to affect mitochondrial functions. So these are the powerhouses of the cell that changed the way sperm swam. And then through another series of conversations in literature that I was aware of, I knew that the sperm swimming speed was actually the most important thing that governed fertilisation success across a whole range of taxa. And so suddenly we had this chain of logic where we said, OK, there's these mutations. They're going to affect men more than women. 
They seem to affect male fertility, and therefore we had this situation where we had these mutations that we ultimately identified that uh, altered male fertility but had no effect on females whatsoever, and we called that mother's curse. And over the period of 20-odd uh, years, we have explored this mother's curse idea in some detail, and we have shown that it affects the viability of some of our most endangered populations. And then, in an interesting twist, we showed that you can introduce these mutations deliberately into natural populations and then you can actually control those. And so we've been working for a number of years on how we might use such mutations to control some of the worst pests in the world, things like wasps, some stem weevils that uh, affect our pastures, and of course possums, stoats and rats which uh, decimate our native flora and fauna. So that's one sort of serendipitous piece of work that we're involved in. Sex and fish is always good to put into a title. Um, and one of the most fascinating things that I learned as I was growing up, because uh, I'm a very keen fisher person, uh, is that there are some fish that change sex during their lives. And in fact, actually, the little spotties that you catch off the wharves around the coast of New Zealand are one such species. And when I learnt this at eight years old, it sort of boggled my mind that a female fish could become a male fish. And I just thought, tuck that away as, as interesting and something I'd like to learn one day how that worked. So here in fish land, uh, there are sex changes actually pretty common. It's, so you've got clownfish that start out male and they become female, and just for interest, Finding Nemo would be a very different movie if it was biologically correct. <laughs> and then there are other fish that start out female and become male. And then there's uh, yet others that go uh, both ways, they're bi-directional. They can be female one year, the next year they can be male. And they can switch backwards and forwards depending on how successful they are uh, year on year. It's pretty neat. Anyway, we've been working on fish that change from female to male, uh, just like New Zealand spotty. And the fish we started working on is the Caribbean bluehead wrasse. And this fish changes sex completely in three weeks. So, you, and it's socially controlled. So here we have a, a, a very bright blue male with a harem of yellow females. You remove that male, the largest female generally will change sex and she will show those behavioural changes within minutes, if not hours. And then over a period of three weeks, she will change sex completely. And in fact, within three days, her ovary is degrading and is being reformed as a testis. Uh, and she is able to, she, he, is able to produce sperm at day 10. So functionally a male. Quite fascinating. Anyway, so we did lots of genetics. Uh, won't comp uh, if you want to know more about it, I can tell you all about it uh, over, a, over some beverages this afternoon. But basically this process is a tissue re-engineering marvel and what we've discovered is that uh, there are genes that are involved in the change from female to male and that change involves a complete reprogramming very similar to what you see in early human development when the germ line gets reprogrammed. So it's a pretty neat system and one that we're still exploring but um, that was one of those pieces of uh, th knowledge, I guess, that I tucked away for almost 40 years uh, and then rekindled and actually have been starting to investigate now. Recently, we showed that New Zealand Spotty does basically the same thing. And of course, uh, in this age of COVID, it's much easier to study Spotties than it is to study Caribbean bluehead wrasse, although the water is warmer in the Caribbean. Um, serendipity plays a large part in my um, research. Uh, so. Occasionally I would get invited to give talks at major genome meetings and about 10 years ago there was a consortium of researchers internationally who wanted to sequence the genomes of, of all vertebrates and in fact actually they just published a fairly significant piece of work in Nature today. Um, this group of researchers on their list of top 100 species they must sequence had quite a few New Zealand Tonga species on there and there were no New Zealanders, no New Zealand voices uh, associated with that project and there was definitely not any Maori uh, voices um, associated with that work. And so one of the things I brought back and started the conversations with after I'd heard that work is how could we do this in New Zealand? What level of support was there and indeed should we do it? Anyway, I was pleased to be able to partner with Ngāti Waiwi and also worked with Ngāti Kuata and Te Ati Awa and a number of others uh, to, to work on the Tuatara Genome Project. And that was a, a real privilege to work uh, in, a, in a, 
a, a cultural partnership um, with Ngāti Wai, where I learnt a lot and they learnt a lot and uh, we had uh, relatively clear conversations about benefit sharing. And I think the reason we got this paper published in quite a high profile journal in the end was partly because we had that cultural dimension. We were trying something new uh, in terms of the genomics field, at least for um, animals. Humans, I think, are a little, we're a little bit further down the track, but for animals and for flora and fauna, where there hadn't been a great deal of consideration given to indigenous benefit sharing. Um, for tuatara, it was an important species to sequence from a biological point of view because there's only one tuatara, there's you know 10,000 birds and uh, several hundred turtles and several thousand snakes and lizards. So, but this one uh, species represents an entire lineage of uh, relatively ancient vertebrate diversity. And we found some new things that we weren't expecting. So for example, tuatara genome uh, is, is a bit mammal-like and it's also a bit reptile-like. So that sort of suggests that our distant ancestors back in early um, amniote or egg uh, laying animals uh, was probably a little bit more mammal-like than we had previously thought. And the other thing that was important, and one of the reasons why Ngāti Wai agreed to work with us, is that the conservation of the species was at the foremost um, part of our, of our work plan. And that shared uh, desire to make sure that this tonga was protected and that, in fact, actually these things are here for our children and our grandchildren is, I think, something that we all shared uh, as we went along the way. And one of the things that the genome does, it gives us a framework in which we can start to look at the relationships amongst other populations of this species, and we can start to make decisions about how we better prioritise and work on that, perhaps from a, a restorative point of view. Um, and then I'm going to sort of finish because serendipity uh, doesn't get any better than this. So I may look familiar to some of you because I've been on TV talking about hunting for Loch Ness monsters. Um, and that started really just as a, 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 an idea, really. Uh, I was very passionate about a, a, a technology called environmental DNA. This is the idea that as we move through our environment, we shed uh, cellular material DNA into our environment and we can use that to look at the biodiversity that is present within our world uh, in quite a, an astounding way. And I was being a little bit frivolous, I'll, gr uh, I'll admit it. I was sitting there thinking, well, if the Loch Ness Monster is real, and just hashtag Neil doesn't believe in the monster, um, <coughs> if it's real, it's a biological entity, then we might be able to find an environmental DNA um, trace. And this project gained more attention for doing nothing than uh, all the research I talked about um, uh, previously had, had done for actually had achieved for actually doing some, some pretty neat science, in my opinion. So I tweeted that and it went haywire and I was left with this position where I either had to do it or walk away from it very um, ungracefully. And my children who at the time were about uh, five and eight were very passionate about this and all their school friends thought this was fantastic and I thought, you know what, I can do this. Uh, and so we did. And in June 2018, we went to Loch Ness and we sampled extensively from those waters and we filtered it and we extracted the DNA from it and then we worked out what was present. And this is what we found. Okay, so there's about 3,000 species represented in those samples from Loch Ness. There are salmon and pike and sticklebacks and toads and all the sorts of things you'd expect to find in a lake. And then you find stuff from the terrestrial environment that you might not expect. So you find deer because they go swimming in the loch. You find birds that fly over and poop in the loch. You find various other species that are a, a representative of the broader diversity of the place. And that started me down a, a slightly different path. And then you find all these small things that nobody really cares about, but they're kind of cool, you know, rotifers and nematodes and bacteria. Um, and we, what we managed to do through that project, I think, is just to get people excited about the idea of exploring the natural world and finding new things. I mean, that's one of the things that always gets me up in the morning is that as a scientist, I discover new stuff every day. Sometimes it's that I haven't answered emails that I should have, but, you know, most of the time it's really neat. Um, and so we set a baseline for Loch Ness and I think we showed the world the capability of this technology in a rather novel way. Now, did we find a monster? No, uh, that doesn't stop people from believing. Um, we tested all these hypotheses, whether they be crazy or not, from Pleistocene monsters uh, through to um, 
uh, sorry, Jurassic monsters through, uh, like plesiosaurs through to giant catfish and sturgeons and various eels. But what this project was really about, and this is what I'm passionate about, and we're going to talk about uh, you know, the future. Where are we? Well, we are, stand at a precipice in terms of global climate change. I think we all acknowledge that. But we have tools that enable us to get the information we need so we can show how things are altering. And more, most importantly, we can create, get information that shows that when we take active management and we protect things, that things can get better. And so we use environmental DNA now all the time. And it's exciting because we can go to rivers around the country and we can get information not only about what species are present there, but what's present in the, the greater Fenua. And we can go looking for things that we think are extinct, which is, you know, and if they're not, wouldn't they be fabulous? Or we can go looking for new populations of things that are highly endangered. And we can give people back a sense of why the places that they uh, Whakapapa back to, are special. And we can build relationships with community to really in, uh, enhance the, their goals. So, you know, we're doing projects now to look for kākāpō. We're doing projects to look to see where invasive species are within our landscape. When we control them, does that, make a, 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 does that improve the situation, both in terms of reducing those predators and also improving the biodiversity around us? And what's really exciting is that this technology is now moving out of people like me's laboratories and into communities where you can, EPA will give you a kit like this one in the middle here, you can go down to your local Awa, you can filter out some water, you can look at the species there, and over time we can get a sense of how our world is changing. You know, if, if we're worried about climatic change, we're worried about sea temperature rises, what's that doing to fish distributions and, and species distributions around our coastlines. I can't answer that, but five million people armed with this sort of technology could. What's our waterway systems look like? What are the nitrate levels like? They're bad. What's that doing to biodiversity? Let's find out. You know, you want to still get some traditional kai, you want to get some white bait? Well, I hope you've got some inunga there in that handful because you've got short-jawed kokopu in there or those sorts of species that are highly endangered. I would say you'd want to put it back. Again, these sorts of tools are there and available. And of course, this sort of technology also filters into our health surveillance system. And we're starting to talk now about how could we use this sort of tool on a landscape scale, almost continuously surveying for new viruses, new pathogens, whether they affect us or our, the, the species that we depend upon. I'm going to finish by just saying, you know, there's a lot of people to thank, there's a lot of names there, but I just want to acknowledge that you, nobody does this alone. You're supported by Farnell. you're supported by your colleagues, uh, some of whom are here today and I thank them for, for coming. Um, I'm supported by wonderful students who I've had the honour of mentoring through their journey and I've also been privileged to be part of societies and groups that I have been part of and led and I uh, thank Te Aparanga, uh, for uh, electing me as a Fellow of the Royal Society because that's been quite, uh, quite a privilege and I look forward to contributing to it in the future. <laughs>